We are very grateful to American Scandia for sponsoring our next speaker, and it's always interesting following uh, Lincoln Anderson with a philosopher. Um, but we <laughs> Chief Investment Officer to philosophers. So we have uh, with us this morning Tom Morris. For 15 years, Tom Morris was Notre Dame's most popular professor. His widely acclaimed 12th book, True Success, launched him into a new role in America's most active public philosopher dealing with issues of success and personal growth. Tom has shared his wisdom on national television with Regis Philbin and has been on NBA's Today Show with Matt Lauer. Wherever he goes, Tom brings the wisdom of the ages and the challenges of everyday life with high energy and good humor. Tom is here with us today to talk about true success, the art of achievement. Please help me welcome Tom Morris. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thanks a lot. Hey, thanks a lot, y'all. Hey, look, we're gonna, we're gonna end the morning with something unusual. Before I get up there, let me ask y'all a question. We're gonna philosophize together. Who here in the front of the room, just the first 20 or 30 rows, can answer a question for me? Now, now you know why you sit in the back. You never get to ask a question. Who can name for me any of the great philosophers in human history? From where you sit, yell a name out, anybody. Oh, good answers right away at Notre Dame. I always had a policy. You give a good answer, you get a Snickers bar. Who said Socrates over here? Did I hear Socrates? Right there. Who else? Other, oh, now everybody's got an answer all of a sudden. Aristotle, Plato, who else? Yeah, very good. Who else? Lincoln Anderson. Lincoln Anderson, he said. He gets the rest of the bag. What do you think? <laughs> now, now, wait a minute. In the first few seconds, I heard Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Confucius. Somebody said Kierkegaard. What did those names have in common? What do those philosophers have in common? Yeah. They're dead. That's right. Doesn't look too good for me and Lincoln, does it? Where are the great thinkers now? That's the question. Where are the great philosophers of the present day? You know what I think the answer might be? You might be sitting next to one. Okay, skeptical faces from some of the rows all of a sudden. You all, I'm not kidding. Everywhere I go over the country, I'm seeing something I've never seen before. Just in the last four or five years, in every business, in every walk of life, in every part of the country, people are becoming philosophers, asking deep and challenging questions about things they've long taken for granted. What is true success? How can I experience more fulfillment in what I do? How can I get more balance in my life? You remember the Australian uh, Olympics? I got a call in a hotel room one night live from Australian radio just at the launch of the Olympics. Professor Morris, why all of a sudden are the biggest companies in America turning to you, a philosopher, why are all Americans becoming philosophers? I said, I don't know. Maybe Winston Churchill explained it when he once said, you can always depend on Americans to do the right thing once they've exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll take it. Haven't tried everything else. People are turning to ancient wisdom. We're going to use our short time together this morning to turn to some of that wisdom. We've heard some very good news about things that are going on in the economy, things that are going on in your business. How can you take that news and really make something great happen? We're going to talk today. Actually, it's my favorite topic that I ever speak on. I remember the day I was first asked to speak on this topic. I was sitting in my office at Notre Dame one Friday morning doing what a philosopher does. I was thinking... The phone rang, a big group of really successful people calling me to ask me to come and talk to them about the topic of success. I had no idea why they were calling me. I didn't teach on it at that time at Notre Dame. I hadn't written on it at that point in my life. But I thought, these are really important people. My wife would be real proud of me. I'll go home and tell her. Philosophers have no schedule whatsoever. So I jumped up from my desk. I grabbed my coat. I was on the way out the door. The phone rang again. I jumped back, picked it up. It was a publishing company by some cosmic coincidence asking me what I consider writing a book on success, the very same topic. I ran to the Notre Dame football stadium where I parked my car. I drove the two miles home. I came running through the front door. I saw my wife in the kitchen. I said, Mary, 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 you won't believe what just happened. I, I just got two phone calls, one from a really big group of very successful people. They want me to speak on success. A publishing company wants me to write a book on success. I thought she was going to glow with pride. She just looked real confused. She said, wait, don't you have to be a success before you can speak and write on it? I said, hey, I'm not going to get hung up on a technicality. I'm a student of the wisest people who've ever lived. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Kierkegaard, now Lincoln. Okay, all the great minds. 
I'm going to go back through the centuries across the cultures and ask a question. Is there a universal framework for success in our lives? Universal in two senses, applicable to everything we do, personal and professional, and universal in a second sense, understood by the wisest people in every culture. Y'all, I read hundreds of books, thousands of essays, the most research I had ever done, and I was stunned to discover there are just seven universal conditions for success. I, I brought everybody a little gift, a little laminated wallet card. Hope you got it when you sat down. On the one side of the card, you'll see the seven universal conditions for success that are going to structure our short time together. I mean, th this, this is the first time in my life that I wish like crazy I had complicated red and yellow lines running across the PowerPoints, but <laughs> we'll do what we can. The first condition comes to us from Aristotle, who used archery terminology, telos, the Greek word for bullseye. He said, every human being needs a target to shoot at. In every situation, in every relationship, in any new endeavor, we need first and foremost a clear conception of what we want. We need a vivid vision, a goal clearly imagined. And when I say a clear conception of what we want, I don't necessarily mean what we want to get out of the situation. What we want to see happen is the result of our energies and our efforts. A clear conception. So many people have only the vaguest idea of what they want in life. Did, did you hear the uh, actress Lily Tomlin say a few years ago, I always wanted to be somebody. I should have been more specific. I mean, think about that for a second. <laughs> Doesn't that capture the way a lot of people think and feel? I want to be somebody. I want to do something. What? They have no clue. Vague thoughts cannot motivate specific behavior. We see that all around us in our culture now. People with big dreams but no clear conception of exactly what they want to see happen. Aristotle said, set clear goals. My first my first, the first Stoic philosopher I ever came across, he, 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 in ancient Rome, Seneca, he was a great lawyer, he was a, he was a mover and a shaker of his time. Seneca said, no wind blows fair for a ship that has no port. I thought that as I was seeing the sailboats go down the harbor yesterday, no wind blows fair for a ship that has no port. If you don't know where you're going, you can't take advantage of the things that cross your path along the way. So have a clear conception of where you want to go. You know what, so many motivational speakers for 100 years have been talking about having goals. Almost as if it doesn't matter what our goals are as long as we have some. Well, the great philosophers thought it mattered deeply what our goals are. So I decided to bring you all today the two greatest pieces of advice ever given for powerful goal setting. First of all, probably the single greatest piece of advice ever given for goal setting. Uh, it, it's, it could be the most famous piece of advice ever given to human beings. It's the shortest. It could be the most profound, and it might even be the toughest. With one voice, the ancient philosopher said, whatever your challenge is, whatever opportunity you face, job number one is always the same. Know thyself. Know thyself. Goal setting should be an ongoing exercise in self-knowledge. Too many people waste their lives chasing the wrong things. Know thyself. Actually, in the ancient world, Thales, who was one of the wealthiest people in ancient Greece, as well as one of the wisest, he was approached by a man asking questions about life. The man said, what's the hardest thing in the world? You know what Thales said? To know yourself. The man said, well, what's the easiest thing in the world? You know what he said? To give people advice like this. Okay, we'll pass by that one. <laughs> Third question, what's the most satisfying thing in the world? You know what he said? True success. Now, if I'm right that the most satisfying depends on what Thales called the toughest, self-knowledge, no wonder so many people find true success so elusive in their lives and careers. Know thyself. Well, I decided if I was going to bring you all that, I would also bring you the second greatest piece of advice ever given for powerful goal setting. Even more important now than it was in the ancient world, I decided to draw you all a little, uh, a little picture to illustrate it. Imagine that you're out in the woods on a hike. The great thinkers said, do not allow what is very good to keep you from what is best. So you're out in the woods on a hike. Even more interesting, you're leading a group of other people. Let's suppose you said it is your goal to get to the highest point in the area from which you'll be able to survey all the surrounding terrain. And from where you stand, imagine Hill A is the highest point you can see. Whether it's perspective or fog or whatever it is, it looks like Hill A is the highest point. Your goal is to get to the highest point, so you climb Hill A. You slip and you fall, you struggle, you pull yourself back up, finally you get to the top, from which vantage point you can now see for the first time the much higher he'll be. Now, let me ask you all a question again. 
If your goal is to get to the highest point in the area and you now stand perched atop Hill A, what's the first thing you're going to have to do to attain your true goal? Anybody? Go down, go downhill. And what are other people going to say? Don't we know? What do you mean we have to go downhill? It took us a long time to get here. This is very good. We can see a lot from Hill A. There are so many people, there are so many businesses, there are so many families right now stuck on top of Hill A because nobody wants to go downhill. What does that metaphorically represent? Changing what you've most recently been doing. The great philosopher said, you make it to Hill A, great, throw a party, have a celebration, set up camp, but let it be your base camp for your next ascent up the next highest hill. Life is supposed to be a series of adventures. If you're not living your proper series of adventures, you're not going to experience fulfillment in your life. Do not allow what is very good to keep you from what is best. Now, y'all, I've had to live this in my own life. I, I was a full professor at Notre Dame. I was a, a you know, tenured job for life. I, I'd been at Notre Dame for 15 years, and I decided it was time for a new adventure. And I was the first person in the history of Notre Dame to ever resign a job, not to go to another university, but just to do something really radically different. People said, what are you, crazy? I mean, you're leaving a guaranteed life income. Your kids' educations are going to be paid for. You're leaving all this. I mean, I got to tell you about my job at Notre Dame. I worked on Monday and Wednesday, okay, <laughs> two days a week. And lest you be too impressed by that, I worked an hour in the morning on Monday, an hour in the afternoon, and I repeated that arduous schedule on Wednesday. Now, when I told people I was going to leave that job, they said, are you going to notice the difference? I mean, at first. And then, and then they said, how could you leave something like this? I had 12 teaching assistants to do all the grading of papers for me. I taught an eighth of the student body every year. I was having an amazing time. But I could feel that it was time for a new hill. It was time for a new mountain. And, and you know what? I, I've, I, I'm having the adventure of my life. It's an amazing thing. And so you don't have to make a dramatic change like that. Sometimes it's an inner change. Sometimes it's a change in hobbies, something you're trying to learn about, something you're trying to do new and different with your clients. And sometimes it's not so much at, at a particular juncture that you have to climb a new mountain, but maybe some of the people you work with have to. You have to help them see that hill be. Now, wait a minute, you might say, the philosopher's talking to us about success. That's something in the outer world. But so far, we're just talking about inner stuff, a clear conception of where we want to go, a vivid vision. You know, the book of Proverbs says, without a vision, people perish. Einstein gave me my slogan for teaching at Notre Dame when he said, imagination is more important than knowledge. But, but, but imagination, vision, self-knowledge, you know, inner boldness, that's all you know, stuff inside you. I mean, what's the relationship between the inner and the outer in this world? I was with a big group of insurance executives in Aventura, Florida, not too long ago. I, I just arrived at the airport. I, I, I was taken to the Turnberry Club. I was, my flight was a little late. I was running into the Turnberry Club. Four guys were coming off the golf course. At first, I didn't even notice them. One of them recognized me from a poster. He, he yelled, Professor Morris, you got to come over here. I got to tell you something. I was going to be on in 10 or 15 minutes, but I ran across the lobby, and, and he said, I know you're on really soon. i got to tell you what just happened. He said, you're going to want to hear this. The four of us, we have a pact amongst ourselves. Anywhere we go in the country for a conference or a meeting, we play a few holes of golf the day before or the day of before we go into the meeting room. We always play a few holes of golf. Today, we got in, you know, late last night. You're on now in a few minutes. We had to start this morning. You know, we go out to the course. We didn't have much time. This guy, he points to one of his friends. He was the first one up. Professor, he stretches every muscle in his body before he'll swing a golf club. I don't know if it's yoga. I don't know what he's doing. We said, come on, take your swing. We got to go. Professor, he steps up to the ball. He takes his swing, and for the first time ever, this character missed the ball. The, the three of us stared at him, and he looked back at us and he said, whoa, tough course. <laughs> Ain't that the human condition, he said to me. I said, you're right. Thank you very much for telling me that story. We live in a world of people yelling tough course. You know, what, what about terrorism? What about the global economy? What about the competition? What about, you know, all these unknowns? The great philosophers were always people who said, you know what, it's not the course. It's what you bring to the course each and every day that counts. Bring a clear conception of what you want to see happen. Well, you know, number two, there's an attitude 
We need a strong confidence that we can attain that goal. Now, Rosabeth uh, Moscantor is going to come and speak about confidence. It's such an important thing. Cicero in the ancient world said, you know what, in this life, attitude is almost everything. We need an attitude of confidence. Well, you know what, let me not go back to ancient Rome and Cicero. Let me rewind 100 years. My favorite American philosopher, William James, Harvard professor, Great scholar, philosopher, psychologist, William James studied champions in every sport. He said, you know, the things we call sports are so different. Rowing, running, skiing, hiking, basketball, baseball, you know, all the tennis. The activities are so different, and yet, you know what, every sport has its champions. I wonder if despite the differences in their activities, all the champions across all sports share any set of characteristics in common. He investigated every sport of his day and he said, you know what? I think that every champion shares with every other champion one quality. He didn't think we had a word for it in the English language, so he coined a phrase from Latin, the phrase precursive faith. Cursive to run, cursive writing runs across the page, pre, ahead of, Faith that runs ahead of the evidence. Now, here's the insight. James said every champion is regularly challenged to do something he's never done before. Climb a new mountain, break a new world's record, wrestle a new opponent. If he just looks in his past history of accomplishments and asks himself the question, do I have evidence sufficient to prove I can do this? The answer will always be no. The evidence of the past is always insufficient to prove the success of the future. But he said the champions are precisely the people who don't let that hold them back. They run ahead of the evidence, precursively believing in themselves, in any new challenge. He told a story about a mountain climber who was on a difficult ascent. He slipped and he fell to a ledge. A blizzard was coming on. He'd die of exposure unless he made a jump longer than any jump he had ever contemplated. James said, if he stood there and said to himself, I can't do this, there's no way, there's no way out, I'll get killed regardless. If he engaged in what psychologists now call negative self-talk, he'd be lowering the objective probability of his success. But if he engaged in precursive faith, what they now often call positive self-talk, things would go very differently. He would be raising the objective probability of success. You know, I can do this, this is what I've done all my legwork for, I can make this jump. James said, don't don't get me wrong, you can't talk yourself into jumping over this building. I mean, we all have limits. In a famous essay, he said, the exciting truth in this life is we don't come near our limits. He told the story about the mountain climber because the man used precursive faith, made the jump, and lived to tell the philosopher the story. Now, I remember saying, boy, have I ever been stuck on the side of a mountain? I mean, even metaphorically, have I ever been challenged like this? Two days later, I get a phone call out of the blue again. Friday morning again, I don't know what this is about me in Friday morning, is this DDB Needham Advertising, Chicago, Illinois. Professor Morris, we're doing a nationwide search for a philosopher to be the national spokesman for Winnie the Pooh on Disney home videos. I said, really? And she said, we've searched the country, east coast to the west coast, for a philosophy professor with personality, and we can't find one. <laughs> well... I said, well, why are you calling me? And she said, well, we heard you used to play in rock bands. You, you've done all kinds of crazy things. We, we think you might be the guy. And I said, well, I love Winnie the Pooh. And she said, well, <clears throat> could we come to campus this weekend and get you on video to see if you might be right for network television? And I said, I just did a show on the ethics for the Learning Channel about a week ago. Do you have the video? I said, no, it's in, it's in Washington, D.C. She flies a guy from Chicago to D.C. just to pick up that video. He flies back the same day, gives it to a guy writing commercials for Disney. He, he's, he looks at it and he, he decides he wants to use me, but he has to get permission from Disney. So he flies to L.A. on Saturday morning. He shows my video to, to five Disney executives. And he called me and he said, Tom, they watched your video. They came to me and said, we like this guy, but is there a problem with his southern accent? And the writer of the commercials who was born in Asheville, North Carolina, said, what accent? <laughs> so they hired me. They called me Monday morning and said, you're the man. We're going to fly you this week to L.A. We're going to make TV commercials. I said, whoa, uh, you know, can, 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 can you fly my family there? They've never been to California. And my kids love Winnie the Pooh. No one I taught at a Catholic university. She said, uh, how many family members are we talking about here? <laughs> 17 charter a plane. No, there are four of us. 
Okay, Professor, we'll fly the four of you to L.A. first class. We'll get you a suite of rooms in Beverly Hills. We'll pick you up at the airport in a limousine. I said, could it be a white limousine? <laughs> She said, why do you ask, Professor? My daughter, Sarah, 10 years old at the time, had always wanted to ride in a white limousine. She said, uh, we'll have to switch limo companies, but we'll get you a white limo. But listen, this afternoon, stand in your office at Notre Dame, take a good camera, roll a 24 film, and take a picture of everything, the walls, the ceiling, the floor, everything. A guy's coming tonight for your film. I said, what's this for? She said, you'll see. We'll tell you. You'll see when you get here. A guy rings my doorbell that night. I'm from Disney. I've come for your film. I said, what are they going to do with this? And he said, they don't tell me anything. I just got to take it back out to L.A. I said, well, here it is. Two days later, we fly to L.A., first class on the plane, white stretch limo, picks us up with my kids' favorite snacks in the back. They take us to a, a building, a room, 10 times the size of this room, 20 times as I've never seen anything like this, like an airplane hangar, like a warehouse, all dark, except in the middle, under spotlights. My Notre Dame office in every detail. I mean, y'all, the mess it had taken me 10 years to make, they created in two days. I mean, <laughs> Diet Coke cans and paper and stuff. The difference was my desk at Notre Dame was fake wood. In Hollywood, it's real mahogany, okay? <laughs> I had a cheap computer. They had top of the line. I had a beat up old electric guitar in the corner. They had a $3,500 Gibson Les Paul guitar in the corner. I said, could I take 24 pictures of this office and send them back to Notre Dame? I could live like this. Oh, Professor, didn't you know Disney spent $3 million on this commercial campaign? $3 million. Oh, yeah, we're going to make six commercials. You're going to make two today. Your two will be the centerpiece of the whole campaign. They've hired the best people in Hollywood. Uh, you, 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 this is going to be an experience. Man, talk about having a mountaintop experience. You know how I fell to my ledge? Oh, Professor, could you stand next to your desk while we uh, focus the cameras? Oh, okay. All of a sudden, out of the shadows emerged 75 crew members. And all of a sudden, I realize they're all looking at me. Suddenly, a phrase implanted itself in my brain, the phrase, weak link in the chain. <laughs> I've never made a TV commercial. I could blow $3 million. I panicked for five seconds, 10 seconds, until I remembered William James and Precursive Faith. And I started saying, I can do this. I'm in front of students all the time. I can be in front of these cameras. I can do this. Six hours of the hardest work I think I've ever done in my life. Well, you know what my job was like, don't, so don't be too impressed. Uh, <laughs> six hours that day. I heard myself saying all day long, no problem, I can do that. No problem, I can do that. That's fine, I can do that. Oh, Tom, Tom, this time, please, can you smile not with your mouth, but with your eyes? No problem, I can do that. About a half hour later, I hear a guy say, smiling with the eyes, take 37. <laughs> 36 failures in a row and terror in the eyes is not what they were after at that point. I said, William James, you tell me I'm supposed to have initial faith, upfront confidence in any new endeavor. What about when I start taking my lumps? What about when I start failing? What about when I fail 36 times? What do I need then? You know, James never explicitly said, but because my son was there that day, I came to understand the concept of precursive faith more deeply. I came to understand that we need two kinds of confidence. Yes, yes, indeed, we need initial confidence in any new enterprise. But we need a second kind of confidence. We need resilient confidence. You ever watched on VH1 before they were stars and all these you know, shows about uh, rock stars and country music people and, and how they failed, they failed, they failed over and over and over again? Well, read the stories of people in the business world. Do great people never fail? No, the most successful people in human history have often failed a lot. They try to minimize the implications of that failure and they learn from their failures and adjust. We need resilient confidence, confidence that can take its lumps and keep going. My son, my son's presence that day reminded me that he was eight years old, big baseball fan. Just him being there brought to mind the image of another eight-year-old kid standing on the street corner, ball in his left hand, bat across his shoulder, other kids around. He's not talking to them. He's chanting into the air, I'm the greatest baseball player in the world. I am the greatest baseball player over and over and over. He finally looks a little self-conscious, walks down the driveway into his backyard where he thinks nobody can see him or hear him. And he says it again, I am the world's greatest baseball player. Throws up the ball, takes a swing, but like the golfer, totally missed the ball. He doesn't hesitate. He picks it back up. I am the greatest baseball player. Throws it up, second swing, missed it again. 
picks it up, the greatest, the greatest. I am the greatest baseball player. Takes his third and biggest swing yet. Missed it again. At that point, he just looks at the ball lying in the grass. He sighs out loud. Oh, three strikes. Wow, what a pitcher. Now that's resilient confidence, isn't it? I said, hey, I could use a little bit of that. I said, wow, what an actor. Somehow I ended up smiling with my eyes. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. The Disney people started laughing. You look just like Jiminy Cricket, which is what they were going for. Well, I don't know what that means. My kids were so proud of me. We made two uh, TV commercials for Winnie the Pooh that day that my kids were proud of me. They said, Dad, you're a Poolosopher. I had done something they could relate to. My wife said she was so proud of me. She got her favorite new vocabulary word that day. As, as we were leaving the studio, somebody said, oh, professor, you'll start getting residuals very soon. <laughs> I said, what's that? I literally didn't know I was going to get paid for this. I just love Disney. I love Winnie the Pooh. Oh, professor, every time one of your shows, uh, one of your commercials uh, is aired on TV, uh, you get $500. That's like my monthly salary as a philosophy professor. You're kidding, right? Uh, no, sir, 500 bucks. We got home to South Bend. They were showing my commercial on the Today Show, the Tonight Show, the bold and beautiful Wimbledon, they were showing it five times a day. In the first six weeks, they showed it 159 times. My wife would walk through the room, see my face on the television and say, cha-ching, let's go to the mall. <laughs> thanks to William James and thanks to that kid. You know what the kid was doing? He was living the advice of Marcus Aurelius, emperor of Rome. Marcus Aurelius, like Seneca, whom I mentioned earlier, was one of the great Stoic philosophers. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, every night on a military campaign, Rome was in its golden age when he was emperor. And you know what happens to any organization when it's in a golden period? Everybody else attacks it, right? I mean, y'all have seen this happen. He had to fight more battles than any other emperor, even though he was a peace-loving guy. He would go to the battlefield. He wouldn't fight from the palace. He'd go to the battlefield. And every night he asked the same question. What have I learned today? And he wrote down the answer. He believed that if you and I live with eyes wide open, we're going to learn something every day. He also believed that if we don't write it down, we're going to forget it. We take notes in school. Why not take notes in life? Every day for his journal, he said, what have I learned today? He wrote the answer. One night, he wrote a sentence that has changed the way I approach everything. It's as powerful as it is simple. Late at night, when all the lanterns were out, all the fires were extinguished, he was always the last guy down. He asked that simple question, and he wrote, your life is what your thoughts make it. Your life is what your thoughts make it. Well, maybe you might say, easy for an emperor to say, you know who he learned it from? Epictetus, a slave, who was another great Stoic philosopher. Epictetus said it doesn't matter so much what happens to us in this world as how we think about what happens to us. Your life is what your thoughts make it, so why not make it great? Let me, let me, let me just give you all a piece of advice that, that has been passed on to me. Give yourself the gift of, inter, of mental cheerleading, inner cheerleading. Give, but, you know, before I, before I go to give a speech anywhere in the country, I used to do this in Notre Dame. I was teaching classes. I did it this morning. I'll stand in front of the mirror, grin like an idiot at myself, and say out loud, this is going to be so great, I can't believe it. And if I don't believe it, I'll say it again. This is going to be so great, I can't believe it. And I walk out of the room with a higher level of self-confidence. Now, I know, I know, a lot of sophisticated people say to me, well, you know, I'm too smart for that, that's hokey, that's stupid, you know, I'm not going to do that kind of thing, I'm a little too, you know, beyond that. You know what Aristotle thought? The smartest people need it the most. The smartest people in the world are the people who understand all the ways in which things could possibly go wrong. They need to marshal their energies in a positive direction. So please give yourself the gift of inner cheerleading. But you got to be careful how you do this. I was in Orlando not too long ago. I was in my hotel room. I got a phone call no public speaker ever gets. Uh, Professor Morris, the meetings are running 45 minutes early. Have you ever experienced that in your entire career? You're on in eight minutes. I mean, I'm in gym shorts watching the Weather Channel for crying out loud. I said, I'll be right there. I threw on my suit as fast as I could. I grabbed my briefcase. I ran out the door. I left my room key and everything. I wasn't thinking. I just ran down the, the hallway into the elevator, down the elevator, through the lobby, into the convention center. I'm running. And then I see men's room. I said, oh, yeah, I better duck in. I ducked into the men's room real quick. First stall on the left. And all of a sudden, I realized I forgot my little mental thing I do. So... Right there, I said out loud, 
This is gonna be so great, I can't believe it. <laughs> Three stalls down, a guy cleared his throat really loud. <laughs> I started to go explain. I was just doing a little confidence building, but I decided to just get out of there at that point. <laughs> so give yourself that gift, but carefully, please. Number three, we need to focus concentration on what it takes to reach our goal. You know what? We live in a world of big dreamers who sometimes forget the little steps it takes. I, I know you've seen it in, in clients, and, and maybe you've seen it in, in kids, in your kids. Uh, you know, it, it's an amazing thing. Uh, one of our old uh, coaches, uh, most of my time in Notre Dame, Lou Holtz, uh, is going gonna, is gonna to be with you all in a couple of breakout sessions. I think it is tomorrow. I love it. He and I, and, uh, years ago, did so many talks together for NBC Sports. And I've heard him, I heard him in those years tell the story so many times of when he was an assistant coach, he got fired. He had no job. He had no investments. He had no savings. He could have been very depressed. Instead of being depressed, he sat down with some paper and wrote down goals for my life. And he may tell you all about that. This goals for my life. And he decided to dream big. I want to be a head coach at Notre Dame. I want to win a national championship. I want to be invited to the White House. I want to be on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I want to get a hole in one in golf. Every big thing he could think of. One, I think it was 107 items he wrote down. I mean, giant things. He then decided to take the list to his wife so she could get a sneak preview of their glorious future together. <laughs> She read all 107 goals, then said the one thing he would least have expected her to say, Lou, you left out something. Why don't you add, get a job? <laughs> don't be afraid to start small. An ancient Chinese proverb says, great oaks grow from tiny acorns. Lou had to learn the lesson of the pre-Socratic philosopher Zeno. Zeno said, well, you know, if I want to get from here to the opposite wall, I can't just appear there. I've got to get to the halfway mark first. I mean, before I get there, I've got to get to the quarter mark. Before I get there, I've got to cross the one-eighth mark. Uh-oh, one-sixteenth, one-thirty-second, one-sixty-fourth. Oh, gee, if space is infinitely divisible before I get anywhere, I've got to go infinitely many places first, which is not possible in finite time. Therefore, nobody can ever go anywhere. Okay, <laughs> this is why philosophers have the reputation we have. Okay, calm down, Zeno. You have an insight wrapped up in a famous paradox you may remember from math or physics class, Zeno's paradox of motion. From every start point to every goal, there's a universally best strategy. Divide, then conquer. If I want to be a certain place six months from now, where do I need to be three months from now? Uh, wh where do I need to be a month from now? Well, what should I be doing this week? What can I do today? Divide, then conquer. Daunting goals can become manageable objectives as you divide it up. I learned this from my best friend in junior high school. I was a guitar player. He was a tambourine player. I never thought it was possible to be a bad tambourine player. I mean, you just shake it, you know. He had no rhythm. He would shake it randomly and hit it on things. And he was a singer. He was such a bad singer. He got kicked out of a volunteer Baptist church choir. The minister said, Don please serve God some other way. I mean, he was that bad. <laughs> he would come to my house every day after school and say, Tom, let's start a band. You want to start a band? Let's be great musicians together. Let's start a band. I would say, Don, let's talk about a band later. Let's just play some today. I'd plug in my guitar. He'd start shaking the tambourine. My parents would get out of the house as fast as they could day after day, week after week. Do you want to start a band? Let's start a band. Let's be great. Let's, let's be bandmates. Let's do a band. It goes on forever. Ultimately, I go to UNC Chapel Hill down the road in, uh, from about eight miles from my house. He goes across town to Duke University in our hometown of Durham, North Carolina. His sophomore year, he started doing this like I couldn't believe. I can't be a great musician in Durham. It doesn't happen here. I got to go to a music center. New York, L.A., they're too far. Nashville, I'm going to Nashville. So that's his intermediate goal. I got to get the money to get there. He borrows money from his friends for a one-way bus ticket to Nashville. He's going to go and be great, become great. Uh, he, he says, I got to get a cheap place to sleep. He sleeps in the back seat of a used car for six weeks. Now, I couldn't do it for two days. He did it for six weeks. Maybe I can't surf in, to fame and fortune on the tambourine. Maybe I need guitar lessons. He took guitar lessons. Maybe I could use voice lessons. Talk about self-knowledge knocking at somebody's door. Yeah, please, Don, get some voice lessons. Maybe I need to hang out at the, uh, at the clubs where the good musicians hang out so I can meet some of them. Uh, uh, maybe I need to get a job at night so that during the day I can show the music companies the songs I'm writing. He gets a job as janitor in the Vanderbilt Computer Center at night so he can go to Capitol and CBS and RCA during the daytime. A couple of years pass. I'm at this point in New Haven, Connecticut in graduate school at Yale. 
One night I get a phone call from a mutual friend and he says, Tom, you won't believe this. Listen to this. He puts on a record. It's a great song, a great singer. I said, what's this? He said, this is our friend Don. He wrote it. He recorded it. He's singing on it. He's playing the guitar. It's, it's like Capitol Records number 96 on the country charts. I said, I don't believe it. With no talented bone in his body, just by focusing on everything he needed to do, did Don's got a record out? I got to congratulate him when I come home for Christmas. All the old friends would come home for Christmas. Okay, two months pass. I come home. Where's Don? Where's Don? Nobody knows. Finally, somebody said, oh, didn't you hear? He had to stay in Nashville this year. Everybody's recording his songs. I said, what do you mean everybody? Who? Kenny Rogers is recording one. Now, do y'all remember the late 70s? Before he started roasting chicken and doing other things, Kenny Rogers <laughs> was the number one singer in the world for a while. I said, what? has Don written that Kenny Rogers is recording? And my friend said, I think it's called The Gambler. Anybody remember that song? You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. That was Don Schlitz's first hit song. I think he's won eight Grammys as Songwriter of the Year. I was in the Opryland Hotel a few years ago. I met one of the most famous country guitarists, and he said to me, your buddy Don Schlitz is the greatest songwriter in the history of country music. I said, He's the greatest. It's still hard to process this, you know. And, and he said, you know how many top five hit songs he's written? I just top five on the charts. I said, I have no idea. I think it was 56 top five hit songs for Randy Travis, Tanya Tucker, The Judds, Alabama, Mary Chapin Carpenter. He said, he's made, your friend Don has made so many tens of millions of dollars. He lost count a long time ago. I said, if that's true as a philosopher, next time I see him, I've got a question for him. Does he want to start a band? This is the kind of person you want to be around, a natural master of that focused concentration. Now, y'all wouldn't be here unless you were really good at this. The great philosophers have taught me something, though. Number one, we can always get better. Number two, we have to teach the people around us how to do this because not everybody is born a natural master of focused concentration, but we can all learn it. So never take it for granted. Always remember, whether it's your associates, whether it's your, your, your kids, whether it's your clients, and often it's your clients, they know where they want to be ultimately, but you're going to have to show them how to break it down and get there. Always remember, a focused concentration on what it takes to reach the goal will take us so far. Little things add up, which is why our next condition for success says in little things as well as in big things, we need a stubborn consistency in pursuing our vision. We need a determined persistence. Look at the word consistency. It comes from two Latin root words. A verb, sto stare steti, that means to stand, and a particle, con, that actually means together to stand together. Consistency is about standing together. Do my actions stand together with my words? Do my emotions and reactions stand together with my deepest beliefs and values? Do, do the members, people in my office stand together? Do the members of my family stand together or are we pulling apart? Consistency is always about standing together. I, I, I did a study of failure a few years ago. Why do so many small businesses fail? Why do so many mergers and acquisitions fail to have the results they were promised to have? Why do so many people feel like failures in the richest society in the history of the world with more good advice available than ever before? I learned something that surprised me. The number one cause of failure in our time, in our society, is self-imposed self-sabotage. People acting inconsistently with their own goals and values. Well, why would anybody act inconsistently with their own goals and values? Fear, temptation, laziness, distraction, diversion, confusion. There's so many causes. No wonder inconsistency is such a problem in human life. You want to do one thing and you find yourself doing the opposite. Now, I got a call from a big service organization one day. I mean, most of the times, if, if you and I, if we do something inconsistent in our lives or careers, we fall down, we trip and fall, we pick ourselves back up and get back onto the path. This company calling me, a top executive said, Tom, we've got a problem we need your help with. I said, what's the problem? Persistent inconsistency, she said. I said, well, I've never heard of that one before. Give, tell me what you're talking about. She said, Tom, we got vice presidents at war with each other. We got managers undermining each other. We got, we got uh, 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 people acting inconsistently with our mission statement, our values policy, our strategic goals. We got so much inconsistency around here, 
we're going to come apart. This company is going to go under unless we can do something to turn it around real quick. But we know we can't deal with it until we can understand what's keeping it going. Would you figure this out for us? I didn't know of any great philosopher who had ever commented on this particular phenomenon. So I had to use my secret weapon as a philosopher to solve the problem. I had to stare out the window for three days. And I came up with the answer. There are only three possible causes of persistent inconsistency. And you've seen this at work in people's lives. Number one, the most common, ignorance. People continue to act in an inconsistent way because they don't understand what they're doing. They haven't thought through the consequences of their behavior. They, they're rushing toward the edge of a cliff and they're not slowing down because they don't see it coming. That's the number one cause of persistent inconsistency in our time. Socrates hammered on that all the time. Uh, but that wasn't their problem. They knew what was going on. They sincerely told me everybody in the organization was worried about it. They knew what was, they knew what was happening. So what else could it be? Well, the second most common cause is indifference. You know, did ultimately, deep down, did they not care? I, 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 I got to tell you, I got to tell you something real quick. When I, when I was at Notre Dame, eight summers of my time there, I directed seminars for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Fifteen of the best school teachers in America would come and live together for a month from all over the U.S. You know, Illinois Teacher of the Year, South Carolina Teacher of the Year, these great teachers. And I was their philosopher the whole time. They were, we were doing a seminar together, reading a, a 17th century scientist and mathematician, philosopher Blaise Pascal. Uh, it was an amazing time. They would tell me stories from the classrooms of America that would just knock me out. One seventh grade teacher told me about a seventh grade class of, ruly, uh, of unruly underachievers, kids who were misbehaving, kids who weren't working up to their potential. It was going on day after day. The teacher finally got sick of it one day, came into the classroom and wrote those two words on the board. She called on the ringleader, Bob, what's the difference between ignorance and indifference? And Bob actually said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> Absolutely right, Bob, she said. See what you can do when you set your mind to it. Any teacher can deal with ignorance. We provide information. It's indifference that's so much harder to reach. Did these people not care? Were they really indifferent? They were so worried. They were calling me, the philosopher, to help them. And there was anxiety throughout the organization, so they weren't indifferent. What could it be? The third possible diagnosis nailed it for these people. Once they understood it, they could overcome it, but they couldn't defeat it until they could identify it. In their case, it was inertia. In physics, the law that an object in, at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. In human life, the weight of habit. We're stuck in a rut and we can't get out. Stuck on top of hill A. You know, it, it's, it's amazing to me. How many habits do you and I have? I, I'm getting dressed in the morning. I put on my left sock, left shoe, right sock, right shoe in that order. When I noticed I was doing this every day, I said, why am I doing this? There was no reason I had a habit. If you go to cross a two-way street anywhere in America, you will look first left for oncoming traffic, and then you will look right. 96 times out of 100 or 97 times out of 100. There have been government studies on this and everything because of the rules of the road, traffic approaches from your left on two-way streets. But an ethics professor came into my office fresh back from his first trip to London. Can you see what's coming here? He couldn't because he looked the wrong way. Tom almost got killed my first day in England. David was like a terrorist thing or something. No, no, no. I, I went across the street outside my hotel. I looked left for traffic. Nothing was coming. I stepped off the curb. A bus almost took my head off. I said, David, thank you for capturing for me the human condition. He said, what? I said, a behavior that was healthy for you to have in one set of circumstances. As soon as circumstances changed sufficiently, that very behavior became self-destructive. That is an image of the human condition in times of change. What worked for the past five years may not work in the coming year. What worked for the last, you know, 10 years might be self-destructive in the next 18 months. We have to change with changing times to remain true, to remain consistent with our highest goals and our deepest values. The Chinese have a great image for this. Be like water. When water comes across an obstacle, what does it do? It goes over it, goes around it, goes under it. And what's stronger, water or stone? Well, stone is massive. Stone is heavy and hard. Water is liquid. Dripping water can defeat a stone. The Chinese say, be like water. 
Whatever the situation demands to remain true to your highest calling, to your deepest values, that is what consistency is all about. It's not about blindly repetitive behavior, always doing things the same way. Sometimes it's about getting off hill A and climbing he'll be. Now my dad, my dad tried to quit smoking many times. He smoked three packs a day. My mother smoked two packs a day of cigarettes. I, I never smoked a cigarette. Just walking through the house was about a pack and a half, I think. Just all I needed, you know. He would say, enough for me, I quit. And he would quit for two days or a week. Mark Twain said, oh, to quit smoking is the easiest thing in the world. I've done it hundreds of times. Well, that was my dad, okay? Until one day, he had a problem most people don't live through, his aorta burst, aortic aneurysm. He was lucky because most people die instantly. Those who make it into a hospital, 96% die in surgery. My dad was a mile from a great hospital. Uh, it took people three minutes to get him there. Uh, the, the best vascular surgeon in the South happened to be in the building. He had done the surgery six times in his whole career. All six people had died. But this guy's the best, they kept saying. Oh, good. I'm glad he's here today. <laughs> I mean, how do they judge this in medicine sometimes? I don't want to know. Uh, he worked on my dad 10 and a half hours. My dad was his first patient to live through the surgery. My dad was telling jokes the next day in intensive care. The doctors and nurses were coming to look for him. Where's the miracle man? Where's the miracle man? We gotta see this guy. I was with my father for a long time to make sure that Dacron patch was gonna work on his aorta and, and he, he lived for many years after he, he flourished after that, but I was with him for a long time to make sure he was okay. And then I couldn't see my father for a whole year. I come back a year later, Dad, I don't see any matches, any ashtrays, any cigarette packs. Uh, have you quit smoking again? Every previous quitting attempt, that stuff was all around the house, still inconsistently with his goal. Oh, yeah, I've, uh, no more for me, Tom. I said, oh, okay, when was your last one? I thought he was going to say, you know, two days ago or last Tuesday. Oh, uh, back before the hospital. Dad, that was a year ago. What's different this time? Uh, let me quote my father. Well, you know the aorta thing. Got my imagination in gear. He said, I said, Dad, what are you talking about? He said, Tom, I had never imagined my own mortality. Once my imagination got in gear, that's all it took. You know what? That's all it almost ever takes. If you get people's imaginations in gear, you can help them defeat the inertia that holds them back. In fact, in our own lives, we need to revive our imaginative conception of the good we're doing for people. Y'all, I have, I have talked to people since I knew I was coming to be with y'all, and I, I, I have talked to people about being here today, and you all are praised by so many people around this country who admire what you're doing so tremendously. Never lose sight of the big picture of that difference you're making in people's lives, in the lives of families, in the lives of companies, in the lives of, it, it's just incredible. Every time you, you toss a pebble into the pond, the ripples just go and go and go. Never let yourselves or your associates forget that. And always help your clients to have an imaginatively vivid conception of the good that you're doing together. That makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, you, you know, medieval philosophers explained this. They said the imagination engages the emotions. And in this life, it's the emotions that move the will. That's why Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. You can try to talk people out of in inconsistent behavior, but unless you get their imaginations in gear, we all, we've all tried to reason people out of bad behavior. Unless you get their imaginations sparked, it's not going to happen because the imagination connects with the emotions and the emotions move the will, which is why our next condition for success says we need an emotional commitment to the importance of what we're doing. We need passion. We need an inner fire. We need to bring our hearts to whatever we're doing. I mentioned Blaise Pascal, great scientist and mathematician in the 17th century. Pascal invented the first, uh, uh, the precursor of modern computers. That's why there's a computer language named Pascal. He laid the foundations for uh, decision theory, for hydraulics, for pneumatics, for probability theory. Pascal, great man of reason, is probably best known for one sentence in his Pensee where he said, the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. The heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. Keep your hearts in the game. I want to tell you something. When you have an emotional commitment, some amazing things can happen. People can sense this. Let me, t let me tell you who I learned this from in the most amazing way, the Notre Dame football team. I have the, the most bizarre thing happened. I got a big teaching award at Notre Dame. It was the last one Father Hesburgh gave out. You remember Father Ted Hesburgh's reign over Notre Dame, the longest serving university president in America? He gave me his last teaching award. 
I was so thrilled. I said, Father Ted, I heard that when you hired me, you said, Tom Morris is the last guy I'll ever give a teaching award to, and it came true tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> he was surprised. I was surprised. I wasn't nearly as surprised as I was two months later when the new academic year started up. I walked into the Hesburg Library Auditorium. I, I looked at the students coming in the class. I always got there early the first day. There were more big people coming to Philosophy 101 that I'd never seen before. 17-year-old kids, 6 feet 8 inches tall, 285 pounds, coming into philosophy class. I called the athletic department after that first class. How many varsity athletes do I have this semester? I'd never had more than five or six in a big class. Oh, Professor, you have 55 varsity athletes in Philosophy 101. I said, do I suddenly have a reputation I do not want to have? Oh, no, Professor, we don't put them in easy classes. We have a very different policy here at Notre Dame. I said, really, what's your policy? We put as many of our athletes in classes as we possibly can in classes with faculty members who've won teaching awards, hoping those professors will get them as excited about their academics as they are about their athletics. You know what I said? I'm proud to be at a place that operates like that. Then I said, give me all your athletes and I'll turn them into philosophers. <laughs> Let me tell you what I learned real quick. <laughs> three exams, five essay papers. The, score was all, the grade was always based on three exams, five essay papers. The first exam, we always had some Fs. You know, zero to 100, under 60 is an F, a failure. We had usually Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten Fs. We could have as, much, as many as maybe a dozen in a bad uh, year. That semester on the first exam, 48 Fs. <laughs> well, let me, let me just tell you about the freshman football players. Of the 31 freshman football players, I had 29 in that class. And of the 29, 26 failed the first exam with scores I had never personally witnessed in all my years of teaching. <laughs> Out of 100 points, they were making total exam scores of 7, <laughs> 9, 11, 13, 15. I said, these are jersey numbers, not exam scores. <laughs> One guy worked for an hour and made a zero. I'd never seen that before. There's a point somewhere the defensive tackle got one. I mean, you know, this guy was... What, I can't lose these, this many people. I mean, what am I going to do? I'm not going to change my standards. Philosophy is what it is. It's a hard subject. Let's see, though. I, I lecture on Monday and Wednesday. They have discussion groups on the readings on Friday. I know Thursday I'll give review session for anybody, athlete or non-athlete, making below a C. I call it the below C level club. Come keep your head above water. Come on Thursday. Oh, professor, if you want the athletes there, it's got to be like 9 o'clock at night. Why does it have to be that late? Well, the football team practices from 4 to 8, and then they have dinner, so it'd have to be 9 o'clock. I wanted to be with my family. I wanted to be with my kids, you know. I mean, I'd worked all day. Well, you know. I mean, I, I did research, okay. And, 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 but I cared about these kids. I really wanted to be with them. I really wanted them to learn. So you know what? I would drag my carcass back to campus 9 o'clock. I'd give them an hour of the most energetic, inspirational review session I could possibly give them about hard work, about self-discipline, about the lectures of the week. The coaches all came to make sure their players were there. The first Thursday, 100 students showed up. The second Thursday, even more. All the coaches came again. Every week, the coaches were coming. You could go through Notre Dame football stadium halfway during the season and hear, you know, hear the defensive lineback coach say something like, uh, well, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas said. I mean, these guys were learning some philosophy. <clears throat> Second exam, nobody failed. Nobody. People who were making, you know, single digits were up to C minuses. People who were making 20s and 30s were making B minuses. Even the guy who made the zero pulled himself up to a totally legitimate D. Now, I'd never been proud of a D before, but this guy convinced me, D is for defense, you know, so I should get used to it. <laughs> what, was F for football? I was starting to wonder. T took me half the semester to convince him F was, was not for philosophy. <laughs> I get a knock on my door a week later. Uh, professor, I'm an investigative reporter from the Chicago Tribune. Really? I hear all your, you got all the freshman football players in your big class. Well, I got 29. I hear they all failed your first exam. Well, well, 26 of them did. Now I hear they're all of a sudden doing much better. Oh, they're making B's and C's. This is the greatest come from behind in Notre Dame football, never reported by Sports Illustrated. I'm so proud of these kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could I see that second exam? I hand him the, the see. He thinks the professor is doing his part for the program. Maybe on that second exam, he's going to see questions like discuss the nature of the good. 
in the phrase, good tackle. You know, maybe I'm making it relevant. <laughs> he reads the two questions out loud, present two versions of St. Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God, give three of David Hume's critiques of the teleological argument. He said, football players can read these questions. I said, they can nail the answers. These are the future philosophers of the NFL. If on Super Bowl Sunday, any day in the future, you see anybody in the huddle in the thinker pose, you know they've been in my class. <laughs> How do you teach football players stuff like this? I said, let me tell you what the offensive center told me. I said, how'd you guys turn it around this semester? He said, professor, it was you. I said, I didn't make it easy. No, no, you came in Thursday nights when you didn't have to. You showed us you cared about us. You proved you were committed to us, and that was contagious, professor. We started caring about what you were trying to do for us, and that's all it took. That's all it almost ever takes. People are attracted to people who care. If you go the extra mile, if you show up on your metaphorical Thursday night when you don't have to, man, people are impressed by that. They don't see that very often in our culture right now. They want to plug into this energy. They want to be a part of this. I, I want to tell you something. Some people say, yeah, but emotional fireworks don't go off in my office. You know, it's, it's paperwork. It's phone calls. It's, it's not an exciting place to be. I mean, you know, you, we, we talk about passion. Let me tell you something. I'll share with you all a cosmic principle. I call it the dual significance principle. Every job productive of any good can be given a trivial description or a noble description. What do I do? I'm a writer. I put ink on paper. I'm going to get excited about that in the morning. What, am, what do I do? I'm a writer. Well, I, I provide ideas to people all over the world about things that really matter. Now that I can get up for in the morning. Never allow yourself to lose track of the big picture. Never let yourself forget the big impact that noble conception. Help the people around you to have it. It makes all the difference in the world. When you think of your job in a noble way, it's much easier to do number six. We need a good character to guide us and keep us on proper course. In the 90s, people said, well, can't a bad character have flamboyant success? I used to say, yeah, for a while in a limited domain at the expense of what really matters in life, unethical success is always self-destructive. Well, you know what? Aristotle asked, what makes the world go round? You'd be surprised what he said. Salesmanship. Persuasiveness, rhetoric was the Greek word, the ability to convince another person to enter into a joint project that's of mutual benefit, without which world would be a war of every person against every other person. He said, I gotta figure out what it takes. He said, it takes three things. Logos, pathos, ethos. Logos, logic, information, reason. Know what you're talking about. My dad in his real estate business would know everything about a house, a piece of land. He made a suggestion. People are thinking, well, this is coming from a guy who knows what he's talking about. But my dad, like Aristotle said, people aren't logic machines. You've got to be passionate, pathos. My dad said, I got to understand my client's passions. What keeps them awake at night? What do they love? What do they hate? What do they fear? If I know them on an emotional level, Tom, I can really help them. When my dad made a recommendation, people thought, this is coming from a guy who really understands me. That made him very persuasive. But my dad and Aristotle said, ethos is the key from which we get ethics. You know what it meant in ancient Greek? It didn't mean rules. It meant character. It meant integrity. Aristotle said people are persuaded by people they trust. When my dad passed away 10 years ago, I want to tell you all, it was hard for me to lose my first philosophy teacher. He didn't go to college, but he was a natural-born philosopher. My house was full of books about Plato and Aristotle and Seneca, and I wondered, who are these people? My dad would tuck me into bed at night and give me a little piece of wisdom about the world. Y'all, the, the philosophers you named Socrates had a kid hang around with him every day named Plato. Plato had a shadow follow him everywhere he went, named Aristotle. Socrates taught Plato, Plato taught Aristotle. Aristotle taught somebody pretty famous too. You know who it was? Alexander the Great. When he was just Alexander the Average, when he was 13 years old, but he became great <laughs> through association with greatness. We become like the people we're around. I tell people all the time, apprentice yourself to a moral master to a person with ethical integrity, learn all you can, soak it up from a wise person down the street, across the hall, across town, and then pass it on to the people around you. My dad, when I, 15, 16 people, the days after he died, approached me in Durham, North Carolina. Are you Tom Morris's son? Yes, I am. Your dad was a man of character. Your father had integrity. Your daddy was somebody I could always trust. I said, is that the way people are going to talk about me when I'm gone? If not, I'm not doing the most I can for them while I'm here. 
Character is key. And you know, if you're taking care of that, number seven is a lot easier. We need a capacity to enjoy the process along the way. You know, I was reading a book by a South Vietnamese Buddhist monk. Here I am, Baptist boy teaching at Catholic University, reading books by Buddhist monks. It confuses people sometimes. I get wisdom everywhere. Peace is every step. Thich Nhat Hanh. He says, we're always thinking about the future or the past. The only moment we ignore is the only one we actually have. He says, feel the feet in your shoes. The cloth on your arm, the air on your face. Be here now. When we were kids, we used to just be in the present moment. When I was a kid, I used to lie in the grass in my front yard just to look at the sky. Do we adults ever lie in the grass in our front yards just to look at the sky? The neighbors would call 911. And why? <laughs> Three weeks later, after reading this book, I'm throwing Frisbee with my son. I catch the Frisbee. I say, Matt, can we just lie in the grass and look at the sky? He says, sure. I thought he was going to say, Why? But you know what? It was the most natural thing in the world for him. He was nine years old. We lay in the grass just to look at the sky. Within five seconds, I was having a mystical experience. Brother, son, sister, squirrel, cousin, grass. I, I was feeling one with all the world, oneness with my son. At that moment, he spoke. I remember to this day, 13 years later, his words. He said, Dad, Dad, how high would it go if I did a fart? <laughs> that blew it for me. What do you say to that? I don't know, man. Let it rip. Let's find out. <laughs> For our kids, there's a greater naturalness to life, a naturalness we need to recapture. Okay, not in the crowded room, but you know what I mean. The Greek said, know thyself. I wish like crazy they had said, enjoy thyself. Because you know what? If you enjoy the process, your goal setting is easier. Confidence building flows. The concentration will come. Consistency won't have to be so hard won. That emotional commitment will be part of it. You all, these things work together. I brought you the card because a top financial person in New York City said, Tom, I'm calling you on the phone today because for the first time in my life, two days ago, my purse was stolen in Manhattan. I said, I was nowhere near Manhattan two days ago. She said, no, no, no. Of all the things I've got to replace, Visa, Amex, MasterCard, driver's license, the most important thing is a laminated wallet card on the seven seas you gave me a year and a half ago in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I said, that's the most important. She said, Tom, I read it every day. It changes the way I do my business. It changes the way I live my life. I gotta have a card again. I said, you know what, I'm gonna send you a box of cards. The great thinkers would be so proud of you. Live the wisdom of the ages. Live the ideas that have stood the test of time. You all, I wish for y'all, I, I thank so much LPL for choosing me to be your philosopher and American Scandia for bringing me here today because I wanna tell y'all something, you use the wisdom of the ages to attain that personal greatness that is distinctively yours. And I wish y'all in every facet of your lives true success each and every day. Thank you so much for letting me be your philosopher. True success to all of y'all. Thank you so much. Thank y'all. Woo! You were fantastic. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Morris. Thank you, American Scandia. We're going to take a quick break. You've just climbed Hill A, and now it's time to head for Hill B. The breakout sessions will start right on time at 9.55. Thanks, everybody.